And there are big changes when it comes to feeding your infants or new guidelines that have been issued urging parents to give babies what's called high risk foods early on to prevent food allergies later on. We're gonna sort this whole thing out and we're following Dr. JJ Levenstein, who's here to lead the charge there in this. Go. What, uh, let's talk about some of the big changes. Sure, sure. I guess the biggest change is that parents are not going to be discouraged from offering milk products, eggs, peanuts, fish before the first birthday as was previously recommended. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's pretty radical. Yeah, it that's a little, taken aback by that yeah because it's like if, if your child does have an allergy to peanuts which seems to be prevalent nowadays I mean, aren't you gonna hurt your child I mean I mean how do you find out without okay. putting your child at risk okay so what what has happened I'm gonna backpedal just a little bit so that we can understand this prior to uh, the current guidelines in t in the year 2000 the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommended waiting until a year to give kids milk products mm -hmm. until two to give them eggs and fish and until the three to give them uh, peanuts and that being uh, said the theory was that it would help uh, delay the onset of allergies when in fact the absolute opposite happened so over the next decade there was a skyrocketing of uh, food allergy rates in children and uh, it really prompted scientists to really look at this recommendation and get some evidence for why and one of the biggest clues was a study that was done of Israeli children comparing them with Israeli children in England so Israeli children in Israel eat a little food called bamba it's a weaning food and it's like a little melt away uh, mm -hmm. cookie that they get at four or five year or four or five months wow. of age yeah. it's loaded with peanuts and there's virtually no peanut allergies in Israeli children living in Israel but that same gene pool those same Israeli children who lived in England who delayed the onset of peanuts had similar allergy rates to the United States so that prompted a real critical look at the so research. what is happening in that period right. of time that if we're giving these sort of high-risk foods early on is the body processing it differently than yeah. if we wait after yes uh, in in a, in a word yes and the word is called tolerance now our bodies our immune system have the ability to view anything that we put inside of it as either friend or enemy. And it appears that with a lot of studies now, it's been shown that delaying does not benefit children. And actually by giving some of these high-risk foods under a year, we get into that window of tolerance where our intestinal system right. and the immune system work together, look at it as friend rather than enemy. It makes so much sense. It does, it does. Yeah, and if we does. wait too long, which is probably what has happened over the last decade or so, then the window is closed and potential allergens then have the potential to cause food allergy in children and also some other uh, states of allergy. Well, are there some children though are there, that are more at risk than others? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if you have a first degree relative, typically a parent or a sibling who has asthma, who has hay fever, who has food allergies or eczema, which is also called atopic dermatitis, those are certainly children that we consider at higher risk for developing any allergic manifestations, including food allergies. In addition, if a sibling has a peanut allergy, then your baby has a seven times greater possibility of developing peanut allergy as well. So those are called high risk children. But that's after the first year? No, or is that with that's at the time of birth when you really look at the family tree and you look at yeah. you know who's wheezing who's sneezing who's itching yeah. uh, who's rubbing their nose including you yeah, so I your know. sons I... might be in that category of possible risk it doesn't mean but it's a hundred percent so then so if if there is somebody who has a peanut allergy say mm -hmm. in the family do we still want to introduce that high risk food before the first year yes, and, you then, do. and then I would live in fear at that I point. I would too. Yes, you go to an anaphylactic yeah. shock, you know. So, Do you have an EpiPen available before well, you do it? It's really, it, it, peanuts are one of the few allergens that can cause an allergic reaction on the first exposure. But that allergic reaction on the first exposure is not fatal. It's the second or third one. Uh, but that being said, if there's a family loaded with peanut allergies, for example, you probably want to have that first food challenge in the doctor's office or in the allergist's office where the appropriate staff are there and equipped in case there is a reaction. But the good news is peanut allergies are only 0.6 to 0.8 percent of the population and recent polls of Americans with school children thought estimated that peanut allergy was 24 percent of, of our nation's what? children and it's only 0.6 to 0.8 percent. The schools oh, okay. have you living in fear like oh, yeah. you can't send your kids to school with a peanut butter sandwich anymore. Right. They yes. just absolutely right. forbid it. And we call it peanut panic and these and these food bans don't work because quite honestly many parents sneak in peanut products with their children 
uh, often teachers and staff at the school will also have peanut products around and schools operate uh, on, under a false sense of security with a peanut ban mm -hmm. and in fact a lot of times that backfires and some of the catastrophes happen in schools that so are ill-equipped. Why, why not, uh, why are these new guidelines issued? Why not just keep them the way they are? I mean, what, what's, the, what's the goal here to try to diminish? To try to diminish food allergies in this country okay. because if you truly have food allergy, it means your immune system makes, a, I call it an enemy protein called IgE, so it's a good way to remember it, IgE for enemy. Mm -hmm. If IgE is released and you are going to develop a, a food allergy, a whole sort of time bomb, a cascade, a chain reaction of things can happen where it's life-threatening. So mm. for some children and for some adults, food allergies are life-threatening. And a few times every year, we hear in the news and in reality that some people lose their lives to food allergies. So if we can reduce the chances by introducing foods in that window of tolerance so that food becomes friend rather than enemy, and there are many studies that are going to give us more data even in the next year, mm -hmm. we are going to save lives. You know, there's a lot of controversy though about soy and soy products. Mm -hmm. A lot of pa uh, parents will give their children soy products rather than introducing them to dairy or milk. Right. But w I know there's a big controversial study about soy and how it affects children and giving it to them when they are infants as well as uh, young, young toddlers. So let me break that down. Okay. When we have a high-risk family, so if your family's loaded with allergies or if your child has even uh, exhibited eczema, say, if they're breastfeeding uh, and ha haven't had solids yet, what these new guidelines say is that instead of giving soy formula as an alternative, we want to give what's called an extensively hydrolyzed formula or, or a hydrolyzed formula like alimentum or nutriamogen to those children so that we can prevent cow's milk allergy down the line. So if you have a child with eczema or family loaded with allergies, a high-risk child, and you're not exclusively breastfeeding in those first four to six months, or if you're supplementing, you don't want to supplement with soy, you don't want to supplement with cow's milk, you want to supplement with a formula that has neither of those components in it. And research has shown, really good research, that that's going to help prevent milk allergy down the line in those children. Well, you, you oh, had gosh. talked about some, you just mentioned that we anticipate more changes down the road with mm -hmm. more studies coming out. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we are anticipating to discover in those? Uh, we're hoping to further define that window of tolerance, especially for peanut protein. So mm -hmm. there's an ongoing study in England being conducted by Dr. Gideon Lack. It's called the LEAP study. And what he's done over the last several years has taken hundreds of children who were high risk, who had eczema, who had families with lots of allergies, and he's introduced peanut protein into these babies very, very early. And this is a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, which means the parents don't know what their kids are getting, whether they're getting peanut protein or not. And when the study gets unblinded, when the box lid comes off and we see the yeah. true results, we hope to know what that window of tolerance is because seven years later, he's looking at who has developed food allergies to peanuts and who has not. So this will probably be one of many studies, probably many who are conducted with milk and with eggs and with other allergens, but f with peanut in, uh, specifically, we're gonna start to be able to shape the definition of when those windows of tolerance open and when they close. Well, I know this. <clears throat> Neither of my children are allergic to peanuts because I have made my share of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches <laughs> right. without the crust <laughs> for the rest of my You're life. Allergic. It's just that simple. Oh, I'm good. Uh, anybody else in there with now, me on that one? Peanuts are a, a tremendous source of protein, and they've got so many micronutrients, and to be able to, to give them more freely to America's children is going to be a good thing. But for now, we have a lot of questions, but a lot of answers emerge. We have some good well, answers. If you have, here. Uh, would like more information, uh, go to Dr. JJ. You can go to mdmoms.com.